Hello and welcome to Inside Exercise. I'm Emeritus Professor Glenn McConnell. Today I just finished a great chat with um, Professor Stuart Biddle from the University of Southern Queensland. And we were together for a while there at Victoria University. Before that, he was many years at Loughborough University. He has an amazing track record in all things to do with you know, what does it take to, to get people more physically active? What are the drivers? What are the barriers? You know, how much of it comes down to the individual? How much of it is affected by the environment? We had a really wide ranging discussion. I personally learned a lot. So I think you'll enjoy this one. So stick around. Hi, Stuart, how are you doing? Hi, Glenn, good to see you again. I'm yeah, fine. It's been a while, right? It has, we worked together over five years ago. Good yes. days. So Stuart and I were both at the, uh, what was it? Was it ICEL then or had it changed? It was ICEL, yeah. Institute yeah. of Sport, Exercise and Active Living at VU. Yeah. And now at the University of Southern Queensland. How, how's it going up there? Yeah, good. I'm enjoying it. Yeah. Uh, nice, nice weather most of the time. Uh, yeah. Good good weather for golf. I can't complain. Oh, yes. You're a golfer. I remember that. I'll try. So, <laughs> so whereabouts are you actually up there? So my campus, the campus I'm at, is in Springfield, which is southwest of Brisbane. It's a brand, well, relatively new development. Uh, we have campuses at Ipswich and Toowoomba as well. Right, so you're, you said not only the campus is a new development, but you, you said it was like they're building a new city there. Yeah, so Springfield itself, the greater Springfield area, is a develop, well, was a development that came about some 30 years ago. It started from undeveloped bushland, and now it has the foundations of a town come city with its own railway station, and uh, university campus, lots of schools, shopping area etc it's it's incredible the development that that's occurred all, all due to one person's um, master plan idea yeah wow and how many people are there now uh, uh, i'm not sure the population but it's certainly growing rapidly as are sort of areas just just beyond and uh it, it's a big sort of commuter area into brisbane as well as a area in its own right to, to live and work okay as I mentioned to you, my wife, Kathy, she used to work at the Department of Human Services and she talked about the built environment and how it's an obesogenic environment and how there's not enough opportunity for physical activity. Have they thought about that at Springfield? Well, they have, and they, they've had some initiatives around health and, uh, and some of which are very positive. Um, I still feel that so as you know, Glenn, and others listening to this will quickly pick up, I'm originally from the UK and I moved to Australia in 2014. And uh, Australia, not unlike many other countries, is quite car dependent. Mm. Uh, Springfield is no different. Um, all the developments going on at the moment, including renovations from 20 years ago, are based around getting cars around the place. Mm. So, and you add to that, it's quite a hilly environment and can get very hot. Maybe we're not doing as well as we could do on, on cycling and walking, but they, they have done some good features as well. Green space, cycle lanes, which could be better, but they're there. Um, so yes, they have taken this into account. They want it to be health, a healthy city. Personally, I think they could do more, but um, some good initiatives as well. All right. So, I mean, this podcast, people, if they look back at the previous episodes, you know, I've come from an exercise metabolism type background. But I, that's why I thought it was you know, important to have you on, because you're an expert in the area and we've mainly had sort of more metabolism type people. So, you know, it's all very well saying people need to do physical activity and people need to exercise. But, you know, are they actually doing it? And what, what are the sort of drivers and the the barriers and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, of course, I'm a bit biased. And I think uh, the most important question is how do we get people to do this behavior, whatever the behavior is. So, yeah, exactly. um, so yeah, my background came into physical activity and health through more of a psychology lens. But as our discussion will go on, uh, Glenn, I'm sure that will show that it's not just about psychology. Anyway, I'll maybe come back mm -hmm. to that. So yeah, I like to look at a couple of things here. It, one is, um, you know, the, the types of behavior that we're talking about could be structured exercise, could be playing sport, could be um, leisure time, physical activity that's more integrated into your day. So from a behavioral point of view, we need to understand the behavior we're interested in. Uh, mm -hmm. Secondly is what are the drivers of that or the determinants of that? The word determinants, you could argue is a bit um, debatable, but anyway, determinants of physical activity. 
And then, of course, the ultimate the most important question is how do we change behavior? And, and, we, and we need to understand those previous things. We need to understand what the behavior is. and We need to understand what the determinants are before we can change it. So that's the broad brush overview of how I've looked at this field over a few years. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, it's complicated, right? I, I, I mean, hey, I don't even know. I don't know the field, but it sounds complicated when you think about all the well, somebody somebody has made the point that it's not complicated, but it's complex. Right. Hmm, not quite sure what the difference is sometimes. <laughs> but yes, it's complex because and, and that's right. I think we should realize we should try to understand that it's not just a matter of telling somebody to exercise or um, giving them a program and therefore it's going to happen. Um, wouldn't it be nice if that was the case? I, I, I think it is complex, and but it's then up to us in whatever type of um, physical activity um, field that we're in to help people negotiate through that. You know, yeah, I can make it as complex as, as you like, maybe not always that helpful, but I think we do need to recognize complexity. And so when you listen to a journalist on, on, the, on the television or something talking about exercise and assuming that everybody's going to go out and run marathons or half marathons, it's a naive view. It's much more complex than that. It's about people walking, cycling, traveling to work, doing recreational gym work, swimming, whatever, um, or not doing any of those things, but still being physically active. So, yes, it's complex. And I think that's a good thing that we recognize it. So, so yeah, so it's definitely complicated or complex, whatever the difference was. Um, one thing I, I picked up on there when you said you know, psychological background, and then I guess it's kind of a basic way of thinking, but is it true to say the psychological side is sort of assuming it's up to the individual to do the exercise? And then you've got other factors such as, you know, the built environment, the obesogenic environment, whatever. Is it, can you flesh that out for me a little bit? Yeah, it's a good observation, actually. And I think um probably on average that's correct that the psychology or a psychological perspective is interested in the individual um but having said that i think psychologists health psychologists for example now are much more uh, cognizant of yes there might be a hardcore psychology but it's surrounded by these other influences social cultural environmental and, and so we operate what's called an ecological model. Some call it the social ecological model, where, you know, the individual's at the core, but you've got these other layers of the onion on the outside that have pretty strong influences. So, yeah. And that's something I've changed in my thinking over the years. Um, you know, I was very much wedded to certain psychology principles and psychological theories and now realize that, well, they're OK, they're still useful, but they certainly don't give you the full answer. You've got to look at it in that wider social context. So, yeah, I think the environment is is um, is is crucial uh, built environment or even the social environment. You can talk about that. And, um, I think we should take that into account more. Definitely. So I guess I kind of throw out the built environment. What, is, what does that actually mean? Is it just yeah. mean like how? Yeah. So so the constructed environment like, uh, you know, cities and towns and and so on will provide certain constraints or facilitators for certain behaviors and actually there's usually more walking in cities than there are than there is outside of cities because you're getting from a to b and it's mm -hmm. not either possible or convenient to to have your car with you or whatever so and and you've got you know uh, quite well developed public transport systems in city, most cities which um of course will mean sedentary travel but it will also mean active travel from stations or from tram stops you know melbourne's very good for an integrate integrated transport system so you you probably do a lot of walking in between rather than driving a car door to door so yeah the built environment can be um, pretty crucial for either facilitating or inhibiting physical activity again depends on uh, the type of activity you're interested in Okay, so I, I saw you'd written something recently. Uh, you did a review or something about lack of time, mm -hmm. and you know, is that is that a, a fair enough? I mean, I think all of us think there's a lack of time, but I guess it's prioritizing and whatever. What was some yeah. of the things you discussed? Yeah, so the gist of that was kind of kind of interesting. I, I enjoyed writing that. So it, the gist of that is that 
if you look at the literature on barriers to physical activity, so that's, this is the opposite of what drives people to be physically active. Well, let's look at what stops people being physically active. What are the barriers that people report? And there are lots of barriers that people will come up with when you ask them. But the one that nearly always comes up is, oh, I don't have time. And that's particularly true for structured exercise and maybe some sports participation where you have to go somewhere, do something less, you know, somewhat artificial, I suppose. We've got to do it, got to do it in a gym, or we've got to get changed, we've got to have a membership fee and so on. Yeah. Okay, so we don't have time. That's the barrier that people state. And I've looked at this over the years and I've, I've thought, well, I'm not quite convinced about that. Um, what people are saying is, I don't wish to devote my spare time to this particular behavior you know I, I could spend all my time doing my garden or I could spend all my time playing golf or I could spend all my spare time fixing up my car or whatever it is yeah. you choose your hobbies and leisure because it's basically about leisure time most most of the time yeah. you choose and, and that my and then you, if you look at time use data Okay, and there's a lot of time use data out there, how people spend their time, you will find actually that most adults have at least several hours a day that they do devote to other leisure time pursuits. Yeah. So in theory, they could be exercising for two hours a day. Now, I'm a realist and I'm not expecting them to do that, but in theory, they could. So what my argument is they're choosing not to. I guess the simple one is just to think about the average, I don't know what it is nowadays, three three hours a day or something watching TV. Exactly. So they've allocated their leisure time by choice to a sedentary behavior. Now, yeah. not all of that is necessarily negative. There are some good things you can do in front of screens. That's fine. But um, that's absolutely true. And, and time use data tells you that these trends, of course, changed over time. We're spending way more time on these screens than we used to and of course at one point we never had them at all so that's a good Actually, illustration this reminded me that um i mentioned you in the last pod, uh, the second last podcast with john hawley i mentioned how you'd have those walking meetings yes so at vu yes. you'd have a, a placard thing what do you call it lanyard a lanyard yeah never yeah. say please don't interrupt i'm actually having a, a meeting yeah so that, that was genius well it wasn't my idea i'd like to claim it but um yeah you know, you've got to, okay, so you've got to look for alternatives for your sedentary time, um, creating more activity time and so on. And, and that's a small one, but, you know, instead of sitting, talking one-to-one, -one, we, you know, you could go out and, and walk and get the same um, work done. You can't do it for all meetings, you know, I might have a lot of papers and, and laptops to look at and so on, but, you know, sometimes exactly. you can, yeah. So it's just, it's having it sort of front of mind. I mean, yeah. And it's, yeah. sometimes it's someone else, the fact that you did it made me sort of think about doing it. And my wife would say, because we don't drink tea or coffee, people would always say, let's meet for coffee. She goes, I won't just walk along the river. I will live 200 meters from the river. So now we do, yeah. we walk along the river and chat instead of meeting for coffee. Hey, excellent. Yeah, uh, it, it, it's absolutely doable. And, but, uh, you know, we, so we're looking for alternatives. We're looking for active alternatives yes. that replace sedentary or just give us more physical activity. And, okay. So how do we actually get, because I think okay. anyone would agree that that makes sense, but how do we actually get it, you know, like into that, like the habit and you just, yeah. you know, for me, it's just like, oh, I'll just go for a walk, you know, like yeah. how do you actually get to that point? I, I mean, I don't know if you have the answer. <laughs> Yeah, well, no, I, 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 there are a number of drivers for that. Uh, and depending on the type of activity, first of all, you need the confidence to feel you can do that. And that's why the type of physical activity is important. Walking along a river probably doesn't require as much confidence to do it as, say, going to the gym or, or running a half marathon and so on. So confidence is always usually a pretty good driver. Uh, but the point I want to make here is, well, first of all, you, you, you will have these individual motivators. You know, somebody might be persuading you um, because it's a social thing to do. So somebody almost drags you out of the house to walk. That's yeah. fine. That's social influence. You might be motivated for some health issue. That's fine. That's usually short term, but it's important. The point I want to make is I think the crucial thing here is about um, okay, I'll, I'll use the, the word we use in psychology, which is affect, affective responses, feeling states. How do you feel? People often refer to enjoyment. I could say a little bit about that in a minute. And unless you're getting this reinforcement from the behavior, 
you're, you're always going to struggle to keep it going. And we've we've lost that debate about enjoyment and affect mm -hmm. and positive feelings. It's all about weight loss or uh, forgive me, Glenn, but about metabolism and so sure. on. Yeah. And it is not a, it, 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 it. That's important. Of course, it's important. But to drive people's behavior, we need to they need to feel it's serving them a purpose and it's it's worthwhile and it's got reinforcement and therefore it needs to have some element of pleasure whether it's during or after well i'd like to think that we could we could both be happy with the metabolism talk because in the last couple of podcasts we've talked about how walking for example yeah. can have sort of improved your metabolic health but it yeah. won't sort of increase your vo to max you need to do yeah. something more higher intensity so you know, we've been sort of pushing that, if anything. So the last one, again, with John Hawley was like, maybe we should get away from these, you know, 30 minutes a day or 150 minutes a week, just accumulate exercise yeah. and get that metabolic effect. So yeah. I guess... No, I, 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 t I totally agree. I think the point I'd like to make is that, okay, the metabolic effect or the, the uh, whether it's about weight loss or it's about even mental health, it, it, that's the outcome. Yes. All right. That's a beneficial outcome of being physically active. And that's great. It's clearly what we want. However, those outcomes are not necessarily the only drivers of getting people to do the behavior. Um, you know, otherwise, anybody who smokes would immediately stop. Anybody who drinks excessive alcohol would immediately stop okay. because it's not good for them. I get but they don't because it's reinforcing. And I think I get what you're saying. So, so if you just say go and do this for your metabolic health or your uh, cardiovascular, you know, function or something, it's not enough. Getting away from the point that it's like what for the enjoyment of it. And you're saying there's not enough focus on that, is it? So years ago, I don't know whether you remember Rob Dishman. Dishman wrote a lot around exercise adherence. He did a lot of sort of psycho and biological, psychobiological work. Anyway, Dishman and others, when they were writing for the American guidelines. Uh, or targets that they had way back said that that health will drive your initial involvement in physical activity so you might have a health related reason you could persuade me that i should improve my metabolic health whether it's my obes obesity or whatever therefore i will start to do a bit more physical activity but to maintain it over time and that of course is the crucial thing that's not enough we have to have some kind of positive reinforcement and affective well-being and so um, he always said that it wasn't enough just to have these health and yet that's what we've sold physical activity on exercise is medicine yes it is but is that the message you want to get across okay. and it, you know they're two, they're two different things you, you can still have exercise is medicine but have a different message to motivate people Okay, so that's so, the point I'm getting across. So it's the enjoyment and, and what else? I guess there's the other, some, some insurance funds that'll make it cheaper as well if you're... Uh... Yeah. <laughs> well, there is the uh, economic uh, side and people have started to look at uh, incentivizing uh, physical activity and so on. Uh, results are a little bit mixed, but th there's, some, there's some benefit in that as well. Actually, it's multifaceted. There's no one factor that's going to do it. But uh, all I'm saying is I think we've, not given enough emphasis yeah. to this sort of feel good reinforcement side of things when we're trying to get help people to be more physically active well i guess there has been more talk about mental health but again it's health right but at least it's not just yeah. you know up, yeah. up to the last years it's been health was your heart yeah. you know yeah people are yeah. in terms of effect because i know a positive effect can be you know being less depressed for example yeah no absolutely and and mental health is is important because it's and, and they used to argue, and I don't think that the evidence is that clear at the moment, but the, the, your mental health effects might come about more rapidly than, than some physical or physiological effects, which might take a little bit more time. I don't know whether that's true or not, but I think people can feel the, you know, if there's a bit of stress relief and, and so on, uh, just on, on a more acute basis uh, from being physically active, then that might be reinforcing in its own right. Yeah. Okay. So what about, um, you know, the messaging we give people so you know it, it feels to me and we've talked a bit about this the last few weeks as well that it, it's become so complicated yeah so you know should i walk should mm. i brisk walk should i go to the gym should i do strength should i do you mm. know hit for example i know yeah. you've written on hit yeah 
Yeah. What do you think about the the messaging? Is it is it yeah. is it too complicated? Even the 150 minutes a week, do you think we should be sort of doing that or moving away from that? Or so some people might think I'm a bit of a hypocrite here because I was part of the WHO guidelines group that um, well they didn't come up with 150 minutes. We 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 you know updated the guidelines for WHO and of course they're very similar to lots of other national and international guidelines over the years, but. I've never been a big fan of 150 minutes. Most people have to sit and think or stand and think 150 minutes. Oh, uh, what is that two hours? Is that two? Uh, I can't work it out. If you tell them it's uh, two hours, two and a half hours, three hours, whatever you then. Oh yeah, I, I understand that 150 doesn't mean much to most people. No. Um, so yeah, messaging is really important. I think there's a more important factor here it is that is that if you take guidelines, what are guidelines for? Well, I don't think they are necessarily for the person on the street 100%. They're, they're, they are to help health professionals, policymakers, whatever. This is the kind of physical activity we think will, again, produce the health benefits that's desirable for society. And, um, and then you cascade it down to the grassroots and how you, how you implement that is another matter. And your local personal trainer or your local recreation people, they can interpret it lots of different ways, get people into parks. And they're not measuring 150 minutes. They're just trying to get people to be more physically active. Wow. So that's how I see it. I think they're, they're a high level policy based initiative that's really important. It gets government um, uh, support and, 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 and that's really important. But the actual implementation, I think, could be much more flexible. That's my personal view. And are you uh, a fan of the 10,000 steps sort of? Course? Well, again, you see, I think 10,000 steps, um, uh, people have debated how accurate that is. I, it's fine. You know, if people are going to increase their walking uh, towards, doesn't have to reach, but towards 10,000 steps and they do more than what they've done before, exactly. perfect. Perfect. You know, whether it's 10,000, 8,000, 12,000, personally, I don't really care as long as they're doing a bit more than what they did before. It's, and a, funny thing. it's a funny thing of that, because uh, I used to be a runner and everything, but I'm always injured, so I do cycling. <laughs> Don't get any steps. So, you know, I do an hour That's, ride, well, yeah. and I've got 3,000 steps, and now, yeah. now yes. since I've sort of wind, wound down a bit, I do the 10,000 steps plus the hour ride. So... <laughs> <laughs> well, it does show you that, that, that's a good point because it does tell you that there are different forms of physical activity. Wow. Okay. So, how successful, you know, we've been had all these programs, and all, I, I don't know if you remember back in Australia, probably in the 70s, we had like um, mm -hmm. Life Be In It, like mm -hmm. way back mm -hmm. there, all mm -hmm. these campaigns over time, but it seems mm -hmm. like things are actually, if anything, getting worse. And again, it's complicated, right? Because things have changed. Yeah. You have mobile phones when Life Be, be In It was. Yeah. how do you think we're actually going and, and are we heading in the wrong direction for anything or yeah it's a rhetoric. that's it's probably the ultimately ultimately the most important question <sighs> okay the population physical activity levels are not increasing generally um, are they rapidly declining probably not but they're certainly not increasing I think uh, they're a bit patchy. Some groups are quite active, others are not active, and some groups are terrible for activity. Um, the campaigns, I think, um, have a place, and it's usually, okay, so in psychology and in health behavior change, we talk about different stages of development, different stages of decision-making. Okay. So if, if you wanna get at those who are completely inactive, the first thing you need to do is some kind of persuasion, some kind of get them on the radar so they're at least thinking about physical activity. Yeah. And if the campaign can do that, it's been successful, even though you may not show any changes in, in behavior. That happened in England. Um, I think it was just after the Life Be In It campaign here. Um, the, um, oh, I've forgotten the name of the English one now, uh, which is, be act no, it wasn't be active, but one of those campaigns we had in, in England show and when they evaluated it, they showed that people's awareness um went up, but the behavior didn't. Now you could say, well, that's that's a failure. Or you could say, well, we're starting to just chip away at the groups that need to have a bit more help. Who knows? Because they never last long enough, do they, those campaigns? 
Well, I guess if their awareness, because you know they say first, what do they say? If you have a problem, the first thing to do is recognize you've got a problem or whatever it is. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess if they're aware of it, at least it's on the radar. And yeah, no, that, that, that's that's absolutely right. And and that that's uh you know, there are psychological theories around this of decision making and that the first thing you need to do is to be aware, as you say. Therefore, your first intervention is around education. But education's not will not be appropriate for those who are already maybe doing a bit and need to do a bit more, need help to do a bit more. So it's stage based. Um, so, yeah, campaigns may have that um, positive role uh, in terms of changing societal physical activity. No, we've not been very successful at all. Right. And you could argue that whatever success we've had with these campaigns and so on has been dampened by um, poor environments and lifestyle mm. changes that are happening elsewhere, like, exactly. to, you know, too much uh, sedentary time at home but, and, and uh, cities and towns that are designed for, for, for uh, this one inactive might, travel. You know? This might be a bit of a hard one, but do we know if it actually would have been worse if we didn't have those campaigns? Well, that, I, mean, I, I could argue that may well be the case, but we, we just don't know. We just don't know. You know. So, so when people say, oh, these campaigns haven't worked, that's the pessimistic view. The optimistic view is it's kept us from declining. Well, who knows? Okay. Can you find people that didn't see the campaigns because they don't own a TV or something? And see if they're doing more or less. <laughs> I'm sure. Yeah. No. Well, yeah. I mean, some of those uh, marketing, you know, because yeah. they're marketing, aren't they? The campaigns that uh, do all that stuff. But oh. um, so you've seen a few times different lot, different groups of people. You know, so implied maybe some are doing better than others and whatever. Yeah. I can't help thinking about kids. You know, our kids have grown up, yeah. but they used to do sport as soon as they yeah. finished school. I'm, I'm sure it's different in the states because they've got big college sport, and I'm not sure about England, but. Here, as soon as you finish school, it's pretty much a big drop off. Is 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 there anything? No, it, it that's yeah. true that's worldwide, big... at least in high income countries. And I think uh, actually, I'm I'm not an expert on what happens in the US, but I, I think actually a lot of the US sports are more geared towards higher level yeah. performers. So I'm not sure that even works. Um, anyway, I shouldn't comment because I don't know no. the detail. But yeah, no, for sure. I mean, there has so, so here's a classic case, right, where you know, kids are provided with sport in, in school. Um, some quite high numbers by most standards opt in to a certain extent, either by compulsion or, or, or volunteering. And then when their circumstances change, so they go to uni or they get a job or whatever. Um, so it's their circumstances that have changed. Their lifestyle has now taken on a different thing. So, yeah, um, it shows that it's not just down to the individual making the decision the whole time. It's being influenced by social, cultural, you know, environmental influences. So we need to intervene with that. And I think we need to provide more opportunities for not just sport, actually. I think sport, sport is a crucial part of physical activity, but it's still only a part. So I'd like to see a lot invested in that but also in non-sport physical activity as well to allow them that option of something for, for everybody well that's why we had remember at, at ICL we had sport exercise and active living active living and, and yeah, exactly. I was the professor of active living and I was this professor of exercise and there you go like, hang on uh, is this sport or exercise or is that active living <laughs> <laughs> there's a bit of, bit of fighting about but yeah. yeah I mean active living is what we're talking about here you know it, well well it it, it it is for me, but it's only in the sense that that also includes all these other things. It does include sport. It does include structured exercise. It does include physical activity, however you define that. So um, I'm I'm fine with that. And and my sort of rationale for the work I do is just to try to get population level change or towards a population level change, not just change one individual. And and that sometimes requires a slightly different approach than um, small um initiatives to target 10 people here or gym here or sports club here they're all good and they all add up but how can we get populations moving and, and that might require a slightly different uh, approach yes yeah, so is there across the population you know we just talked about when kids finish high school is a time when things drop off if you were like going to throw you know if you were the the minister of you know health or whatever if you were the minister in charge or or you had a huge you know job well you do have an important job anyway 
where do you think we should target for the best bang for the buck, basically? Or is yeah. it too simplistic? You need to target, target two or three. No, it's a good question, actually, and it's a good one to discuss. I, I think, to me, pop, OK, we should go back and say, well, where have we lost physical activity? Yeah, exactly. And, and therefore, could we replace it? And sometimes you can, sometimes it's maybe not so realistic. So car travel, for example, has replaced more active forms of transport over generations. Now, you're not going to get rid of cars. You're not going to suddenly say nobody can have a car. But you could promote more active travel, given the right um, uh, commitment in cities and so on. And there's a huge um, set of initiatives going on in, in a number of cities around the world that create much more active and healthy cities. And it's not just about physical activity. It's about lifestyle, the way cafes are set up, the way cars travel or can't travel through cities and so on. I think that's it's not the only initiative, but it's a really, really important one. Well, you know, I've, I think, you know, I've been to Copenhagen a few times, you know, visiting right. Professor there. That's just unbelievable. You know, yeah, I, Copenhagen's fantastic. Amsterdam's fantastic. It's yeah. built into the culture. It's and, the culture. You, you know, you could go back and say, well, how did it start? But, yeah. you know, we need to do much more on that. And there was a, there was a, an initiative in Australia, um, actually one of, uh, one of my, old, well, it wasn't quite one of my old students, but we almost overlapped when he was an undergraduate who came out to Australia and he's now working down in New South Wales. Uh, uh, sorry, no, he's now over in Perth. And, you know, he was trying to do this initiative where you can get cars out of the neighbourhood and people would walk and do more physically active transport, but equally got a lot of resistance. You know, oh, don't take away my car. That, that's way too important. And so you've got oh. resistance to these things as well. Totally a mindset, because, you know, in Copenhagen, it's probably the same Amsterdam, the number one sort of, person pretty much as a cyclist and then it's the, yep. the pedestrian and then it's yep. the car like in terms yep. of of how it's looked at and you've got public transport as well yeah and you know it's just totally different the first time i saw a woman you know going out for the night you know holding an umbrella with a with yeah. a bottle of wine and a basket <laughs> at the front and high heels on it's just totally different it's yeah, just you see you, you, awesome. you see uh, young parents cycling with three kids hanging off it's in a dog so yeah. It, yeah it is a yeah it's difficult to wear that mentality you know really took over but i think you're right it's prioritizing and so there's an example so if you prioritize um, pedestrians and cyclists over cars and and you make the infrastructure such that it's easier to travel by walking cycling or public transport exactly. then that tells you something you make it easier for them and we've not been very good at that here or in in the uk and and other the US, I'm, I'm afraid, is even worse in a lot of these things. Um, so, you know, we need to change the environment. This is going back to our environmental uh, issue at the beginning. Yeah. We need to change those town and built environments to facilitate more active living. Um, anyway, so that's where I put um, a fair bit of um, my, my investment, if I could. Uh, but you still need these other programs. But... Um, you know that the changing those environments could have a big influence on a large number of people i think that's what's exactly. important and the other thing i guess is um i was thinking about you know even when it's not easy so in copenhagen when it's in the middle of winter and it's like snowing mm. and stuff mm. i guess they've got to the point that it's been enjoyable and it's been normal for long enough that they still ride to work even when it's not comfortable because they probably you know that thing about 93 months or so you develop a yeah, like a habit. Habit. yeah. So then they've got actually they don't need that enjoyment you know what i mean yeah. so, yeah. so habits uh, habits an interesting one in psychology and i think we've become a little bit more aware of, of habits and you know the habit will so so when you don't have a habit like you know if, I, if i'm wanting to go out walking but it's not really something i've done in the past then i really have to think about it and i have to gear myself up for it and i have to prepare for it and i have to yeah plan it a bit maybe walking is not such a good example but certainly cycling and doing structured exercise and so on you've got to plan these things and actually those those in itself then become barriers uh, whereas if you start to do it and you do it at a certain time or you do it with certain people and you always go to the same place it, it becomes those barriers become less and less and what you're doing is you're becoming almost prompted naturally to do those things so it's like a repetition in the same environment 
And if you can get into that routine, then it starts to become a little bit more habitual. You still have to think about it. You're not suddenly going to end up in the gym and not even thought about it. You still got to do some planning, but it becomes much less. So we got a grant uh, oh, a few years ago now, um, and it was around the sedentary behavior, sit to stand desk stuff and so on. I, yeah. I, I don't need to, we don't need to talk so much about that uh, necessarily. But the call for the grant was they wanted proposals around um, health interventions that required low cognitive effort. No, oh, right. Okay. Now I like that. I suddenly I thought about, oh, yeah. hang on a minute, this could be quite interesting. And the whole sedentary stuff, you know, which is very habitual, the sitting and so on is very habitual. Well, maybe we could do something, and 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 we did. But the principle is that the lower the cognitive yeah, effort no. required, the yeah. better. And as you say, once it becomes a habit, yeah. Because you know, I think we've all had that situation where you haven't ridden outside for ages, and you where's the helmet? You've got to find your helmet, find yeah. your shoes. Yeah. Where's yeah. the cold weather gear? You know, whatever. Yeah. 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 Well, once you. But if if you've you know, it's always difficult to know exactly where you start these things. But if if you know, I walk to work. I walk to the campus. I'm in the house now. But if I walk to the campus, um, I first of all, I'm in a position where I can walk to the campus or I can cycle to the campus. But it's it is routine. It is habitual for me. I don't take the car to the campus. I don't need to take the car. Now, not everybody's in that situation, but you know, you 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 just get into the position where it becomes more and more habitual and. and uh, I think that's I think that's a really important thing and it's something we we kind of forgotten about yeah you know okay so I mentioned hit earlier and, and you know the guidelines and all that sort of stuff you know there's a bit of a debate about you know do people stick to these sorts and I, I know you've written on that a little bit you know because I, I had Marty Gabala on and you know it's great stuff and, it's, it's, and and you say but do people actually stick to this oh yeah yeah they do um, you know, they tend to stick to it. And even well, even when you finish the study, you don't follow them up. Whatever. I'm, I'm not downing any of it. It's fantastic. I, I really enjoyed that, that chat. Yeah, but, yeah. No, it, it, well, I mean, my take on it and, you know, let's put let's put this in context. I'm, I'm not a, a, an exercise physiologist, and, and but I recognize that there could be some quite significant physiological benefits to anything. I mean, to me, we've known about this kind of dose response and so on for well, ever since we studied exercise science haven't we that uh, higher intensity will give you additional benefits fine okay now from a behavioral point of view when i first came across this and um, people were suggesting this was the best thing since since sliced bread and, and whatever i was thinking well, hang on a minute what about for public health public health remember means getting uh, as much benefit across the population as possible Mm -hmm. And I just thought, this doesn't make sense at all. I'm not saying we shouldn't do it. I'm just saying it doesn't make sense to be impactful across a large population. So Alan Batterham and I, Alan from the UK, who was doing some hit research at the time, we debated this at a conference and we wrote it up as a paper. And it's actually had a reasonable number of citations. <laughs> he was in favour, of course. I was against from a public health perspective. Now, what we've now done with uh, Paddy Ekikakis, who's, who's a tremendous exercise psychologist uh, now at Michigan State University. So Paddy and I have just put together this paper. He's done a series, actually. I've just contributed to one of the papers around adherence. And what you tend to find is that in these studies on, on HIT, um, claims are made that the adherence rates to HIT are as good as, if not better, than moderate intensity physical yeah. activity which to be honest doesn't make any sense to me at all our subtitle of this paper is extraordinary claims in the literature mm. um but anyway park that to one side the key thing is that if you look at what they actually do in these studies people who are in the hit condition gradually uh, reduce their exercise intensity you know, they okay. cannot sustain that. And so you end up comparing moderate intensity with high intensity, which start out there and end up here. They're virtually doing the same thing. Oh, so when they look at the people and they say, yes, they've adhered and they've complied and they've continued to do it, they're not doing it at, a, at as high an intensity as they were meant to be. No. And do and, they and not comment on that, the authors? No, no, no. And in fact, there are a lot of anomalies in the reporting of data 
particularly in the meta-analyses. Um, and, and some of the moderate intensity groups actually slightly increase their intensity. <laughs> so you get even more of an effect of coming together. So I, I just think we need to be a little bit more circumspect and a bit more critical at looking at that literature. Um, you know, because they've also claimed that they people enjoy hit more than they enjoy moderate. Intuitively, I just don't believe that. Um, I'm not convinced that the way they measure enjoyment is is the is the right way. I don't really you know, but if you look at some of those enjoyment scales, they've got items in there about challenge and all the rest of it. Well, yeah, you've been challenged for sure. That doesn't yeah. necessarily mean you've enjoyed it. Um, so I, I think the 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 area I'm not. Uh, you know, so others have argued that it's part of a much wider um, array of physical activities that we can offer people. So, in other words, we're giving people more choice. Fine. No, don't argue with that at all. I still don't believe that adherence is going to be very good over the over the duration. Actually, you know, I'm just actually thinking. I guess, I guess it must be an individual difference but also even within the individual because I was thinking I used to be a distance runner and I used to love my interval sessions mm -hmm. right and I used to find the easy ones boring but I realized it's because I was trying to improve my race time so I was actually the intervals even though they hurt they were more like directly achieving my goal now and I'm not racing I just ride the bike I do intervals and I, it's, it's hard and it pisses me off yeah. Because yeah. I, I don't, I'm not actually racing for anything. So I just yeah. within myself, I, I, within my that's spot, right. I was pro it when I was training for running years ago. But now I'm sort of like I'd rather do the, the lower intensities. I just thought it was kind of an interesting sort of. And I, th I also think you know the fact that you were, uh, um, you know, let's say you were training and you're a competitive athlete and so on. That's not public health. That's that's you're the okay. the top X percent. Who are in very good shape and the training and that's fine if people want to do hit for that fine but let's yeah. not you know i think i think actually my little discussion there about myself a bit self-centered there actually fits almost entirely what you're saying i'm doing more population health thing now i'm doing i'm like i'm doing my riding yeah. for health for fitness uh, sorry for health and longevity or whatever i'm yeah. not training for anything no. so i don't want to do hit but yeah. when I'm actually training for something, I want to do hit. So I yeah. think that's kind of, you know, it's ridiculous. It's N equals one. But in a way, it sort of makes sense. That yeah, it does. And, and, you know, some of my arguments about hit are somewhat anecdotal and somewhat sort of intuitive to me. It may not be intuitive to other people. And uh, but I think the evidence at the moment is still a little bit iffy about oh, they, they've made claims that I think are a little bit exaggerated. You know, it's not to say hit can't do people some good. But, you know, let's not get ahead of ourselves and say that people are going to adhere for longer. They're going to enjoy it more. I mean, if that's true, it flies in the face of all the stuff we've been doing in the past. I just don't believe it. OK, right. Well, I have thought about getting debates on here. So maybe we should get you in here. Yes. <laughs> have a debate okay. with the podcast. Why not? I'd line you up again and suddenly someone else just turns up on the screen. That's <laughs> right. Hasn't been discussed previously. Yeah. OK, so, you know, we... we touched on earlier just the fact that um you know lifestyle changes so whether it's diet whether it's exercise then haven't been particularly successful and you know i had a bit of a twitter thing and i was telling you talked to you about it beforehand where you know, someone was sort of saying well we should do just do the medicines if you do the medicines then the lifestyle will come and i, I didn't quite get that do you what do you think about this whole thing about you put them on meds first, you try and do diet and exercise first? I, I, it's not necessarily your specialty. But... No, it's not. But I, I think my comment at the moment would be, OK, for certain extreme cases or more more extreme cases, um, it's like bariatric surgery, isn't it? You know, it, it, if bariatric surgery is successful, as it is to, a, to an extent, but it's it's obviously only targeted at a certain uh, percentage of the population who, who are desperately in need of it. Um, so in the same way, I think some kind of medical prescription, some kind of magic pill, which um, helps you um, fine. But, you know, physical activity will give you so many more benefits. I'm, I'm generally not in favor of let's try to reduce everything down to a to a pill. Actually, I think that almost is is anecdotal or not. That's the wrong word is almost um, a metaphor for for hit sometimes yeah, let's get it down to 10 seconds five seconds four seconds right. I think, is, is that really your aim can't we just 
can't we go out and enjoy these things and, and do them for their own sake? Um, so I, I'm, not sure, I'm not really in favor of this medical approach, uh, even if it does work for some people. Um, but yeah. <laughs> so, all right. So where do you see things? Well, I mean, it's a hard one, isn't it? Because not, nothing's working. I guess that's what the medical people would say. You know, it's all very well. We say people should have a good okay. diet, should exercise, should have more physical activity, but they're not. And memory. Right. So it's actually got to the point. I saw a, a diabetes doctor give a talk a couple of years ago. He said, we used to say to people with type 2 diabetes, you know, work on your diet, do some exercise, and then we'll put you on metformin or, you know, that's yeah. usually. Yeah. But now, now he said, we've realized that all we're doing is sort of wasting six months or whatever, where they're doing damage to themselves. We stick them on metformin first. And we and then we say try and do. I mean, what do you think about that? Because it is it is hard to argue that we're not actually having a whole bunch of success. Here. Okay, I, I probably shouldn't comment on the medical procedures because I'm not expert enough. Right. But I think the general principle about um, not being successful on lifestyle changes, and you're essentially saying that we're not getting the behaviour change that we need to the level that we need to make a real difference. If you want to reduce uh, levels of diabetes and obesity and so on, you know, we need to get people doing a lot more people doing a lot more physical activity and other things. And no, we haven't been that successful. OK, one reason for that, though. Is maybe our approach has not been the right one. So first of all, we've tended to operate the sort of educational model and that and and and, and it's based around the medical model. That is you're told to go and do more physical activity yeah, yeah, right. all right doesn't work um so there needs to be a conversation between whoever it is who's trying to advise you and help you um and the person themselves they need to come together and they need to have a matching of goals so i've got a diagram i've got a slide somewhere which i could dig out which says right this is what the person wants from physical activity this is what the person is told by let's say their GP and they're miles apart. The oh, GP wow. says, this is really good for your health. And the person's thinking, I just want to get out and enjoy being in, you know, doing something that I enjoy. I never even thought about my health. That's not my motivation to be here. Yeah. Um, okay. And so there's a mismatch. And I think we need to do much more um, talking with patients and other people about what it is they want to get out of physical activity. Why, why do they want to do it? What would switch them on to physical activity? And, and then we provide that supportive environment rather than just tell them to go and do something. Okay, so rather than, them, like, you know, fix something. rather than trying to fix something, you know? Yeah. yeah, yeah. People don't want to get fixed necessarily. No, that's right. And, and I think health is important to a lot of people. I mean, uh, you know, as I've got older, the, yeah, certain things become in your head about, um whether it's longevity whether it's about functionality whether it's about you know cardiac health and so on yeah of course you can't dismiss it but that's not the reason i get i i'm physically active it, it, it's much more than that and i think we sometimes forgotten that um you know that that's the case so what you what you're getting at is is a fundamental question of changing human behavior and uh, there are there are 101 models out there that's half the problem actually there are too many ways of looking at this and too many opinions and, and, and yeah. some good good opinions and good theories but if you look at a, a recent sort of popular approach to this and this i'm simplifying it ridiculously into a small snippet but if you look at changing behavior you probably need to look at people's capability of doing the behavior so that's where this hit thing just grates a bit with me people's capability to do some of this is going to be pretty low anyway capability opportunity right where are your opportunities and how can we create more opportunities and then we should look at motivation um, and if we combine those three you've got a pretty good predictor of behavior now the motivation side comes in two parts one is where you really think it through so I'm going to say, OK, Glenn, uh, you told me I ought to do a bit more cycling. OK, well, I'm going to get my phone and I'm going to get get a new app and I'm going to plan and I'm going to get a diary, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, yeah. Very cognitive, very uh, planning based. And that's fine. But it's also a lot of effort. 
So there's another side to motivation, which is where I don't really think about it very much at all. And uh, and uh, and I'm, I naturally, not perfectly, but somewhat naturally fall into physical activity, whether I fall into cycling or walking. Well, why would I do that? Well, I've got great facilities out here. I've got a nice walking path. Um, yeah. You know, uh, cycling is prioritized, like we spoke about earlier. There's no traffic. Uh, it's crime free. So I'm happy to go out even when it's dark. So you've now got a natural environment, natural and built environment where you don't really have to think about it. So those two go together. And in psychology, we call that a dual process approach. You think about it and plan it, but you also don't think about it because you don't have to. Exactly. And, and, and actually, if you don't have to think about it and it's a natural thing, it's much more effective. That makes sense. You know, so, so just to finish on that, if you walk into a, a hotel lobby and, and the lobby has lovely stairs right in front of you, I bet you walk the stairs. That's I don't true. mean you, I don't mean you personally. Uh, whereas the lift or the elevator is right in front of you and it looks attractive and it's got nice music and menus for the restaurant, you go you go in there. You don't think about it, you just do it. Exactly. So the well, way we set up the environment can can make a big difference. Perfect. All right. So I guess you're angling towards, uh, you know, if you're going to talk about individual responsibility versus the the environment, you'd say you'd be leaning toward. Obviously, you need a bit of both, but you'd be leaning towards changing the environment, making the environment more susceptible. Or definitely both, um, because ultimately you could have a fantastic environment of which nobody wants to interact with, or um, you know. Uh, they need a little bit of psychology, if you like, individual psychology. But no, you, you do need that environment and you, you do need the facilitating by whether it's policy, whether it's environments, whether it's social yeah. context, you know, so a school, a workplace, uh, your community provide something that then makes it easier for you to do that behavior. That's now, this so gets political. So this gets political. Okay. Sorry. Go so on. this the social we mentioned a couple of times. I, I I keep thinking about that. So you know, at the end of school, if everyone else went off and, and kept playing netball and rugby or whatever, then you'd probably go and do it, right? But most people exactly. Don't. And the same, you get to Copenhagen. Yeah. You, even if there's all these bike paths, if no one was using them, you, you'd feel like a bit of a weirdo, right? But because everyone's riding to work, yeah, it's normal. So so not not only is it social in the sense of other people are there, but it's become the social norm. And yes. as you say, you don't you don't feel the odd one out. And, you know, years ago when I was jogging back in the 70s, you know, people would shout at you, get your knees up and all this stuff. And you felt, you know, a little bit intimidated, I suppose. You had to be even more motivated to stick at it. So um, and that probably that, that was a more serious issue for women at, at the time. You know, they, they felt um, not not good about going out to, to run and so on. So times have changed, you know, that social norm has changed, but um, it's the, the, there are still social norms out there for sure, yeah. Okay, just starting to think about finishing up. I think we've, we've covered quite a few things. I just can't help thinking about COVID and what effect that's had, because it's a bit of a mixed bag. I mean, yeah. obviously you'd think people are doing less with lockdowns and things, but, but then again, there's a lot of people jumping in front of their TVs and things. So yeah. you know what people have found on that? Or? Yeah, that's no, a really good question. And um, it is mixed. My understanding, and I don't claim huge expertise, and I haven't done any COVID uh, specific research of any description, but my understanding of the literature is that physical activity levels have increased for some groups. And this was, this was when they were doing more sort of more draconian, well, that's the wrong word, when they had more lockdown situations, um, you know, more, more, um, we were right in the middle of the COVID pandemic that, that, that was hitting without vaccinations and so on. So I think the physical activity levels were a bit mixed. Some groups did more, some groups did less. On the sedentary side, where they measured people's sitting behavior and screen time and so on, it definitely increased. Yes. Uh, that's not surprising. We were all working from home, well, not all, but you know, you and I working from home in front of screens. Kids were being homeschooled in front of screens. Yes. So sedentary behavior went up. Um, probably eating behavior was less healthy. I don't know what the evidence shows on that. And physical activity was more mixed. What I'd like to say on this is that, isn't it interesting that when we had strong government uh, guidelines, in fact, rules about what you could and couldn't do, one thing that was always there, you could go out and exercise for an hour a day. Wasn't that interesting? They never say that at any other time. 
<laughs> so you know at least we got that one right they should have um, made it compulsory yeah that's right yeah but now, you know, they so, didn't want to do it then they want to <laughs> well you see i live i live in springfield lakes which is part of the springfield community here and, and we have lakes we have man-made lakes actually person-made lakes person -made. and um you know they're, they're great for walking they really are and uh during the covid lockdowns that we had uh, a lot of people out walking a lot a lo lot more than i sometimes see although actually it's quite a popular place to walk so yeah covid's an interesting one uh, it, it did i think it has kind of bimodal distribution maybe yeah it's probably going to affect things for quite a while well, I worry about, uh, I don't know what the data tell us on obesity rates, on eating behaviours, obviously mental health, um, yeah. and then of course all the uh, pathology around the COVID uh, itself. So That's a bit depressing. Now, why don't we finish on something a bit more positive? So if you, okay. if you just got a grant now for $50 million, what would you... Um, <laughs> I'm, you 100, I'm feeling generous. 100 million. Oh, you're retired. <laughs> that has to be reused on research. What would you? What would be your dream study at the moment? You think? Well, I, I do. I, I'm still quite committed to the idea that we we need to be driving people's behaviour through affective feelings and and so-called enjoyment and, and, and so on. And that means it would probably be more so be less structured exercise and more habitual physical activity in the community. And, and that would relate to more walking and active forms of transport. So if you put all that together, that yeah. would be my big, and that's not to say nobody's done that in the past, but it would be city-wide, community-wide, um, multi-faceted intervention where you target lots of different things, the workplace, the community, the transport system, the education system, uh, the health system, and they all work together um, it's what we call a systems approach, where we we look at the complexity and the interrelationship between all these different systems. That would be the um, uh, that would be a, lo a lovely project to do. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and I think I, I mentioned to you earlier on that my wife Kathy. I keep mentioning her, but it's fair enough. She's been in the US for two months, and she got back last night. So, <laughs> yes. um, yeah, she was involved in the study. They got like this town of Colac and they looked at the whole community and they, you know, rather than bits and pieces, they, they and, and they had positive effects. So something yeah, that's like, got to be the way to go, I think. Uh, and of course, they're difficult to do and there's probably a fair bit of investment. But, um, you know, it, it does mean that, that things are in synergy and things are working, hopefully, in, in tandem to, to help each other. So the transport helps, the schools are, are on board, the workplaces are on board. And... Um, you know, you've got a much better chance that way. We, yeah, we call it a systems approach. It, it's back to this issue of complexity. Um, you know, it is complex, but you've got, you're getting the, the dots joined up a bit more. All right. Well, great having you on here. Thanks for coming along. Well, thanks, Glenn. It's been great. I, I'm, I'm sure we've uh, gone off on a few tangents, but uh, I, I thoroughly enjoyed the discussion. I, I think we kind of, we went off and we came back and we ended up, I think, summing <laughs> up pretty well there. Sounds what good. About, is there anything you wanted to get out? You, you've got a book out at the moment, haven't you? So I've had the book called Psychology of Physical Activity, which I've co-authored with um, one person, Nanette Mutri from Scotland, and then a couple of other people have joined us for subsequent editions. We're on our fourth edition, and we even had a forerunner to the first edition, which, so if you include all of them, it's over 30 years. Um, wow. So yeah, it's kind of interesting. And we've just updated, and 2021 was the fourth edition, and it's how things have changed over the years. And I'm writing a few, uh, papers at the moment to, to describe how how we've reflected and changed over a 30-year uh, period of looking at psychology of physical activity so a lot of the issues we mentioned today have come up and um, I, I've, I've, I've really enjoyed that yeah so psychology of physical activity is the book yeah. yeah it's been a great chat I've really enjoyed it as well so thanks a lot for coming along Stuart and I'll you're very welcome Glenn great yeah. to see you okay see you mate yeah cheers <laughs>